Okay, Paul, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself. Get the picture of uh, Devin Jensen up. No, we see the river. A sunset on the river, maybe. They actually look better. <laughs> That's what I think. Oh, uh, let's see. All right, what's happened here to me that I didn't get that to work? So the slideshow. Now yeah. then, did we yeah. get? Did we, nope, not yet. We're not. We still have the group now. Ah, uh, you're not sharing. For some reason, so in the show, back to share screen. Seems like I ought to learn how to do this one of these days. Okay, then, we see your sharing. Yeah, okay, you there he is. You well, got it. Two years of messing up. I, I've got a lot of practice of messing up, probably more than I do doing it right. So that's <laughs> that's why I keep practicing this way. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. Uh, any of you that happen to be new and uh, want to join this extended family, you're certainly welcome to. Robert Cook is normally the one that uh, picks up the email addresses and then sends out the, the invitations, but he's not with us this evening. Deb is doing that uh, task instead. Or you can send an email to uh, debarthp at gmail.com and I'll forward it to, to Bob, to Robert. Our, our presentation this evening comes from Devin Jensen. He is the executive editor and social media ma manager for the BYU Religious Studies Center and the BYU Religious Education. He coordinates the office's editing activities and has edited 250 books. And I think, I think, remember. Uh, but uh, he's gotten, they, his books have earned, earned numerous awards from the Missouri History Association, or that's Mormon History Association. And he and a talented team of researchers have written a forthcoming book called Battlefields to Temple Grounds, Latter-day Saints in Guam and Micronesia. And so afterwards, because Rita's from Polynesia, and here he's been writing about Micronesia, then we have some commonalities to share. He is a storyteller who enjoys church history. He brings his interest in panoramic art with ties to the Book of Mormon to us this evening. And so we welcome Brother Jensen. Brother Jensen. Let me see if I can get that to turn. Devin Jensen. All right, why is it not turning? Well, let's try the slideshow and start. All right, let us pray. Great artist of the universe whose panoramic displays amaze us morning and night, whose palette of tints and hues seen on butterflies and flowers extends beyond our visible prism of light, whose tapestry so full of galaxies and black holes portrays the birth and death of stars and whose fabric permeates all creation the insects, galaxies, micro dimensions, and even ours. Yet, as we bow in deep respect, again wanting to look again perspicaciously to see, we ask as well for your blessing on our presenter, Brother Devin Jensen, an editor with appreciations beyond the expansive Mormon family tree, and pray that our awareness of your influence in creation in sculpting us in painting the skies can be expanded to appreciate the history and mystery of artistic exercise. For we pray for our world, O oh Lord, its senseless violence, for the wars and violent threats, for the beautiful plains and mountains, for the seas that swallow our depths. And we thank you for the healing power transforming our disasters with your predictive insight for providing us with scripture, prophecy, your son, your spirit, each nudging us toward the light. In the name of Jesus, your anointed son, 
the centerpiece of your tapestry, the panorama of life. And then we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. The floor is open, Devin Jensen. Thank you for coming to share with us the panorama uh, mysteries of the uh, of the whole art world before us this evening. It's exciting to to be able to look at the artistic expression and learn what we can from the history. And somewhere there's a book of Mormon tie here, and I'm sure you're going to bring that up as well. Thank you, Paul. That is so beautiful. Can you see my slide okay? Yes. Wonderful. Okay, so I want to just first of all start out and say thank you to all my cousins in the restoration. I had such a wonderful time at the John Whitmer Historical Association, and Paul uh, greeted me with so friendly and Steve Pineker, and evangelical. And um, I just felt uh, really uh, embraced uh, with that Zion spirit that Paul is seeking to encourage through these types of gatherings. And uh, I'm so um, deeply moved by that prayer that you offered about, you know, the panorama um, uh, uh, that God creates each day. And uh, he, he does good work. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much. Well, um, so I, I am going to share some, some reflections on panoramas. And of course, um, St. Louis, Missouri was a center of panorama um, creation in the 19th century. It was a, a, a happening place. Um, look at that image that you've probably seen this before, but they would use, they used to create these uh, panoramas that would be used and they'd set them to music and you could, sometimes they would be moving uh, but basically, they were a way to introduce people to uh, scenes like motion pictures that would help people say, oh, this is, this is the world we live in. They were newsreels of a sort, allowing Eastern spectators a chance to view in an idealized form the untamed frontier of the West. And so this that we're going to talk about tonight is the story of how panorama fever spread from St. Louis and other places uh, to Nauvoo and to other places, uh, including Utah. Um, this, 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 what I love about this presentation tonight is it's got a lot of Missouri history. And I will tell you that I am uh, really interested in your perspectives. As we talk about something, if you want to um, add something, I would encourage you to, uh, to think about which slide you're interested in, and we'll talk about it at the end. So just be thinking as we go um, these, they, I have a question about this, or I have a comment that you, I'd like to share, and uh, we'll get back to that. So this will be very interactive. Uh, so back to this, these panoramas. Um, so these offer uh, stories of faith and fortitude, persecutions, and perseverance. Uh, it talks about some of the indigenous population, in, particularly in Utah uh, territory. But this, these are stories of the settling of the West and the middle, Midwest as well, including the hardships that the saints uh, uh, experience. So we're going to start with the story of my great grandfather, Philo Dibble. You recognize him. Uh, he's in he was he was in Kirtland, and then he ended up in Independence, and he ended up in quite a few places. He ended up in, in uh, Nauvoo as well. And so this story starts with the tragedy: Joseph and Hiram were killed. This was an unthinkable loss to Philo Dibble and the saints, and they couldn't, they couldn't imagine this. So on June 27th, 1844, when they were murdered in Carthage, the bodies were taken to Nauvoo on Friday, June 28th. The next day, George Cannon prepared the bodies for burial and made death masks. William Rowley took those death masks and made a positive impression so that we have what we have today. So Philo had, Dibble had a dream. He said, I looked and saw Brother Joseph coming with a sheet of paper in his hand. So the, imagine this in connection with panoramas. The paper was rolled up. Joseph threw the roll into the top of a tree. The roll came tumbling down through the limbs and all under the tree watched the roll to catch it. And I caught it. And so in that dream, he also saw Joseph and Hiram martyred. And he, this is how, you know, as dreams are, they're, they're subject to interpretation. He said, I think what that means is I'm supposed to go get some canvas and have some art scenes painted. Now he was not particularly a painter himself. He, he, did, he did house painting and things like that, but he knew that there were a lot of immigrant artists like William Major, 
um, and he knew uh, Robert Campbell. And so he started recruiting these folks to start painting. And so he created a list of scenes that he thought were very important. Now, this is a whole big laundry list of things. And I will just mention the topics. But what's interesting about this, if you're familiar with the work of CCA Christensen, who followed him in Utah Territory, you'll notice that he picked up 12 of these 13 scenes in his famous Mormon panorama. And so, um, and, and by the way, Philo did not like that because he had applied for copyright of these. Well, you can't really copyright a, a, a thought, a concept uh, in, in a sense of like, I own this concept the rest of my life. Um, so, but look at this, the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, the battle above the big blue and the falling of the stars. Um, so maybe you know that story. The tremendous stor storm of the Lord in defense of the camp of the saints is, is part of Zion's camp on Fishing River. The Battle of Crooked River, the massacre at Hans Mill, uh, the surrender at, at Far West Missouri, the last speech of General Smith exhibiting him upon a building addressing the citizens of Nauvoo. That one, by the way, th that was the first one of the first ones created. And also this assassination of Joseph and Hiram Smith in Carthage Jail. That one, that painting we know was in progress on March 7th, 1845. So less though, so just a, really a few months after um, Joseph and Hiram were killed. And reception of the bodies in the city of Nauvoo, showing the temple and the tomb. So, so these were the scenes that he outlined as really important. Um, and so then we see this kind of this is this is an actual clipping from the Nauvoo neighbor. Will be exhibited. Uh, let me turn the, I'm gonna read it because it's a little hard to read on the screen. On Wednesday, August 6th, at the Masonic Hall, the splendid painting representing the massacre of Joseph and Hiram Smith in Carthage Jail, June 27, 1844. Doors open from 4 till 9 p.m. Good music will be in attendance. Admittance, 12 and a half cents. Note, note bene, those having, quote, the cash, end quote, are particularly invited to attend. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it sounds like it was a kind of a free event, but really, if you have money, you're really welcome, Philo Dibble manager. So he was basically kind of a, an entrepreneur, uh, a showman. And he said, I want, I want to show people these scenes that are really important to me. So um, this is the best known surviving scene from that panorama. This is the small painting by, by Robert Campbell. And um, what we know this was used to create the big mural because it's got pencil hatch marks around the outside of the small watercolor, indicating where, um, if you wanted to blow it up, you'd say, okay, this section, I'm going to do this and enlarge it over that. And these murals were quite large. They were about 10 by 12 feet, so 128 square feet. But basically, imagine uh, the size of a, a wall, a cabin wall, or, or some large wall where you could display this. And so um, they. what's fun about this particular piece is Hosea Stout says um, in 1840, March 1845, this painting was in progress and he had people showing up in their uniforms and he was painting their likeness and the men were having a dispute about it because they said, this guy wasn't there that day. And so they wanted it to be 100% 100, 100 accurate. And so they were looking at this and saying, oh, how can we make sure? Well, it's, uh, it's pretty accurate with the the buildings in the background, you've got the Nauvoo Mansion uh, and other structures there. And in fact, uh, as I was talking with, I think it was Robert Cook was telling me that this, these were very important uh, to show where the Joseph uh, and Lucy Smith home uh, was. And so, so it was fun that they, they, they tried to do this as accurately as possible. Um, so let's go on to the next one. So pretty soon he, he added to his collection the, the death masks of Joseph and Hiram, he paid $100 uh, for them. And uh, we're fortunate that they were preserved. These were part of the show um, or the exhibition um, and or, uh, this panoramic view of, hey, here, here's our, our beloved prophet and patriarch. Um, here's my memories of them. And again, with music, uh, they were inspirational. And they, they, um, these were used um, many, many years um, to... to uh, in, to tell the story of the restoration. Um, okay, so uh, I want to just, oh, I'm going to actually pause here um, and say Wilford Woodruff uh, at the at the uh, Canesville uh, log cabin, log tabernacle, said on the right hand was a view of the martyrdom of Joseph and Hiram in Carthage jail, and the left hand 
was the canvas representing Joseph Smith's last address to the Nauvoo Legion. He changed it, by the way, from the citizens to the Nauvoo Legion. As Brother Dibble has been moved upon to set up these paintings, I feel to bid him Godspeed. And if he will get up the uh, get up the sceneries of this church, commencing at the beginning and go through it until now and onward and fit up a gallery in Zion, it will be the continuation of the rise and progress of the church and kingdom of God in this last dispensation and will form one of the most interesting sceneries that can be found in Zion. So he wanted to see, he saw this as the beginnings of a, an art museum. And, um, and so Philo would go around in, um, in, in, in Canesville and then uh, later in Salt Lake um, and, and Utah County also and show these, um, these scenes. Now, here, um, here's another scene that I believe is from this same exhibition, um, and this, is, this has been occasionally circulated, but this is the expulsion of the saints from far west Missouri, on November 2nd, 1838. So we're going to show some, some very rare scenes. These have rarely been seen. Um, this, the town of uh, far west at that time featured 150 houses, dry goods stores, three family groceries, six blacksmith shops, two hotels, a printing office where Elder's Journal was, was printed, and at least two schoolhouses. You'll notice in the center there of the painting, that's by design, I believe, you've got the uh, cornerstones for the temple. And so um, uh, that, that was the square where uh, Sidney Rigdon offered his address that was somewhat inflammatory and, and stirred up um, problems. Um, so Missouri Governor Lilburn Boggs issued an extermination order on October 27th, 1838 to exterminate the saints or drive them from, this, from the state. A state militia of 240 men attacked the community of Hans Mill on October 30th, killing 17 men, women, and children. And then on November 1st, 1838 at Far West, uh, uh, Joseph and Hiram were surrounded by state militia troops that's shown in the background. Uh, commanded by General Samuel Lucas and Robert Wilson. Um, so, so there was a, a court-martial held pr promptly, and that was when David Atchison and Alexander Donovan uh, refused to comply with that uh, decision to execute uh, Joseph. So uh, this is a, an interesting image and has a lot of artistic value, you know, just to, to show what, what the, their conception of what it was like. And um, I notice, you can notice in the background, they, they kind of took a, an artistic shortcut. They would paint one horse and then they, you'd see this is the outline of the next uh, horse or soldier next to them. So yeah, that was kind of, that's kind of fun, characteristic of this folk art. Well, later on, uh, Philo added to his um, exhibition, uh, the Battle of the Bulls. And this was the Mormon battalion uh, scene where they were, they were uh, going along, they were finding water and firewood and meat from numerous cat, wild cattle in the in the area, and on the eleventh, uh, the battalion had its only major battle in quote marks of their journey when a number of wild bulls charged, and a dusty, chaotic melee ensued. The rampaging bulls charged on and on, almost uh, uh, you know hurting uh, Levi Hancock. There was great confusion and fear. At least three of the men of the battalion were injured, three mules were gored, and some of the wagons were overturned. Uh, so the battalion killed at least uh, nine bulls. So this is this is kind of an, an interesting image to to show that chaos happening. So uh, this is kind of fun. Uh, what we're doing with PowerPoint is 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 not that far off from what they they did. Um, uh, Philo transferred his images uh, on the great big murals to slides. They were called magic lanterns, and you can see here's a little image of that. It's basically an early slide projector. You know, in the in the late 1800s. Um, and you can see in the bottom right there, uh, there's a ticket uh, indicating the, um, the admission. And so you pay a little bit of money and go to this and, and, um, and feel uh, inspired and uplifted. So that's our first pan panorama, some, some neat images. Now, this next one is a very rare one. Um, this one was, this is the, the earliest Book of Mormon art that we're no, and so I, I promised I would sh uh, share some Book of Mormon art, and this was painted by Danish American uh, uh, artist CCA Christensen. Um, now let me tell you a story about where this came from. So, uh, so its whereabouts were unknown until a few years ago, about ten years ago, when church historian Marlon K. Jensen um, was at a 60th high school reunion planning meeting. A classmate asked him, "Would you like to see some art?" Uh, pa painted by uh, C.C.A. Christensen, 
And the answer was, of course, yes. They they showed this showed them this art. This is the back of the art, by the way, painted by uh, you know has his name on there. Uh, it, it, by the way, Ephraim is misspelled, which I think is charming. And it's got a little in the corner. It looks like uh, October 1871. And uh, on the face of it, it had little matchbox car tracks, you know, where the grandkids had driven across the 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 art. And uh, it was stored under the waterbed. And you just go, oh heavens you know so close to catastrophe this thing is a very valuable piece of art this is the only 19th century panorama that we uh, for latter day saints that we know of that's still intact that's not carved up into to, to pieces so um uh, utah art gallerist david erickson called this panorama quote the most important 19th century mormon doctrinal visual document i have seen or has been discovered in the last 30 years i agree with that quote so let's talk about how this was used so on your left there, you see Dimmick Huntington, who was a, a Shoshone translator, and he traveled all over Utah territory, and he thought, I need to have some visual communication tool to help our, um, our native tribes understand um, their history, the history of the Bible, because this was just an unusual concept for them, and then to understand how it tied in with the Book of Mormon. So really, this is a the, one of the first linkings of Book of Mormon and, and, and Bible art that we have. And so he recruited CCA Christensen, this Danish-American um, immigrant, and also Dan Wegland, who was a Norwegian-American um, uh, immigrant. And so they 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 painted this art. So here's our here's our little PG thirteen moment here. We're going to have an Adam and Eve uh, uh, mo, uh, scene. And so uh, so here here's what they painted. They 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 created this creation scene, and you can see the serpent in the background um, uh, tempting Eve. Um, and you can see Eve offering the apple to Adam. Um, and you can see some some of your uh, your native. Um, wildlife, uh, jackrabbits, and uh, I don't know, is that a goat and a bear and a rooster, uh, maybe a horse in the background. And uh, so um, uh, this is to introduce them to the, the beauties of creation and, um, and Adam and Eve. And so now we're going to go on to the next one. So Cain and Abel was the next one that they depicted. So think about this image in terms of what was going on in early Utah. Okay, so we had brother versus brother, right? We we're the house of Israel, but we were warring with each other. So this was a, an opportunity for, the, for them to say, "Let's not kill each other." You know, um, you know, let's. You know, they're all trying to trying to worship God, but doing different ways. There's there's a, a stick there in the the foreground with the blood on it. So yeah, it's kind of a visually a dramatic scene. Then we go on to this next scene. Um, this is uh, Noah and the Ark. And um, the covenant is represented by that beautiful rainbow in the background. You can see if you're, you've got a bigger, bigger screen, you've got uh, uh, Noah and somebody else on the ark in the background. In the foreground, you've got some bodies. Ooh, another PG-13 moment. Uh, and you've got some, uh, some animals eating the, uh, the carrion there. Um, and you've got some mountains, maybe perhaps uh, in, indicating the waters receding at this point. Um, so interesting interesting art okay so here's our book of mormon type um so i love that cca christensen has got a dog there um this is lehi and his family and they're crossing out uh getting into the going to the wilderness you've got nephi in the beginning there um in the foreground with uh with his bow it's kind of a small bow um you've got him with a, his blue sash you can recognize him in this these scenes uh, you've got lehi and soraya no sisters um you've got uh, layman and lemuel uh, and they're they're leaving the city. You've got the city, the the walls in the background. And by the way, you can see in the background, you can see how the, all these images are are all connected, and they they are continue to be connected to this day. Okay. And then you've got uh, the the next scene is this um, uh, rebellion against Nephi, and he, and he's telling him we can make it across the lands. Let's just pray. And and Laman and Lemuel are fed up with it, so they tie him to the mast and. Um, you can see the, the the dramatic scene with the waves rising and um, anyway, the, the the tension there. You can see the tension in the face of Leah and Soraya uh, in that uh, small um, cabin in the back uh, on the left side. And so then finally, the arrival in the promised land, um, you can see Nephi raising his hands in, in exclamation and prayer. 
and gratitude uh, to be there. You can see people uh, getting piggyback rides <laughs> uh, through the water, um, carrying their supplies on a, on a little stick. Um, and I'm sure Jacob and Joseph are in there. You can see more, you now. you can see children and uh, more representation there. So, um, uh, you know, perhaps vaguely suggestive of the Americas, right? You've got some North, North American looking trees. And of course, uh, CCA Christensen is kind of painting what, what he knows and what's around him, but, but he, he does pretty good um, with landscapes. He's a little bit more basic on his figures. Uh, okay, so now we're connecting the dots for our indigenous tribes. Um, with this artwork, you have um, back to Jerusalem um, and that area, uh, Judea, you've got uh, uh, John the Baptist uh, baptizing Christ, and you have a, a, a diagonal shaft um, indicating uh, the Holy Spirit with the with a dove back there. And then you've got some uh, Middle Eastern looking trees and uh, foliage in the background. So, so kind of fun there. Um, now, uh, connecting uh, the representation of the atonement of Jesus Christ or the, re or the reconciliation um, that he accomplished, uh, you've got there on the background on the top of the cross, the, the King of the Jews uh, in, in Latin, I guess the abbreviation, and then you've got, uh, uh, you know, blood. So it's a little bit graphic uh, from the, you know, his, his hands and his feet. Uh, and then you've got that, uh, again, the di he does that a lot, C.C. Christensen, uh, the, 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 the light shining through at that moment, uh, indicating the Father's um, care for him uh, in that moment of great agony. So uh, connect back to the new world. You have Christ visiting after the, the time of great destruction, and you've got uh, the 12, 12 apostles there. Um, and you've got, uh, let's see, yeah, you count 12 of them. You see the, all the various uh, clothing styles, um, kind of uh, vaguely European or, or I don't know what, what the, the, the headbands, are, uh, the headdresses are. Um, and then you've got in the background the, uh, uh, some pyramids uh, indicating ruins. You've got some ruins that are, that are not pyramids, but in the background, but uh, all, all interesting things. Trying, he's trying to Christensen's trying to portray, um, you know, the new world, it probably suggesting the location, but not really pinpointing it. And then you have Moroni receiving the plates at the time of great uh, destruction at the end of the Book of Mormon and passing the, a wounded Mormon passing the plates to Moroni and giving him the charge to, to take care of him. There's the sword of Laban as well, and the soldiers in the background and, and the, uh, the helmets are interesting because they look kind of uh, European and, and whatnot. But, you know, again, he's trying to visualize what these scenes might have looked like. Finally, uh, the final scene of this one is Joseph Smith receiving the plates from the same Moroni now resurrected. And so you've got that uh, nimbus around Moroni, Moroni indicating his, his power and authority. And you've got, uh, uh, I guess you've got the, uh, the, the stone uh, there and you've got a pretty steep hillside on Komora. Um, but uh, so, so those are, those are some neat images. And I, I'm, I'm going to guess those are probably new for all of you. Uh, uh, maybe one or two of you have seen them before. So, uh, uh, so how are these, um, what was the effect of the, of the, uh, the teaching? Well, uh, we know at least one point uh, in 1873 that, uh, that Sagwich um, and, and of the Shoshone people was having dreams and visions that he, he wanted to be taught. We don't know exactly when, when they would have involved the panorama in, in teaching them, but he, he asked George Hill to come in, in, the, in the Ogden area and come down and, and baptize him and his people. Um, George Hill deferred. He said, I haven't been authorized to do this. My, my prophet Brigham Young is the one who has to authorize me. Brigham Young wrote to him and said, I've had something weighing on my mind. I really want you to go serve a mission to the Shoshone. And so George Hill said, I will do so. And so he he boarded the train. He was that's what he did. He worked on the railroad and he, he went to Ogden. They were ready for him. They 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 smiled and said, We're ready, we've been waiting for you. Um, you know, Sagwich told us you would come today. And so he he they led him on and uh, basically he baptized 101 of their 102. Uh, people by there by the, the in the Bear River, which is a very significant um, 
River for the Shoshone people in northern Utah and southern Idaho. And uh, they had a name for George Hill. That they knew him well. He'd been in the, in the Salmon River mission, and they called him Inca Poppy, Inca Pop. Inca Pompey, man with red hair, <laughs> and so uh, so uh, this is this uh, painting is in the uh, in the Provo Temple and also in the Brigham City Temple, and uh, so I, it's kind of fun to show you that image. Anyway, so that's a that's a uh, um, uh, I guess a little bit of a uh, a bright spot in our Utah territory has had a lot of low moments um, with our native and uh, settler relations, but uh, that uh, baptism and, the, and, and some of the resulting things have been uh, some of the happier moments of, of Utah history. So here's a, an image of uh, right there in the center with the, the man with the pendant on it, the beaded pendant on his, on his chest as Darren Perry, and he's a Shoshone descendant. And the guy next to him with the uh, blue shirt and the kind of gold tie, that's Bob Freeman. He's a descendant of, um, of Dimmick Huntington. And so, uh, and, and so then we've got a few other art historians and Shoshone historians there. And so this, this panorama passed to uh, George Hill, whose descendants preserved it, and, and it's still awaiting dis display. I hope it'll be displayed in the next five or 10 years. Uh, I do know that Darren's working on a, um, on a uh, Shoshone interpretive center near Preston, Idaho, and hopefully um, it may appear there. So. This next one is a fun one, CCA Christensen's Mormon Panorama. I remember, you remember I told you I, um, there were a lot of connections with the uh, Philo Dibble. And so we're gonna kind of just go through this one fairly quickly because these are a little more familiar, but they're really they're really cool. And, and so Christensen uh, uh, would, dis, would painted this display and about, about 1878 began to walk around, uh, tour around with this. And um, and show people this. And again, Philo Dibble was a little upset because he says, "I have publicized. I own these these scenes." And 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 Christensen said, "No, you know, you know, I, I'm going to do my my show as well. You can't just copyright this scene, and nobody can ever do it." So, so, uh, but uh, he. This is a quote. He said, um, "The old generation who bore the burdens of the day of, in the persecutions in Ohio, Missouri, and Illinois will no longer be with us a few years hence." History will preserve much, but art alone can make the narrative of the suffering of the saints comprehensible for posterity. And that's true, right? When you when you paint something, when you write a story down, it preserves that in a way that's really significant. So his first image, unfortunately, is lost. It's of the first vision. Um, and so that, that one no longer exists. But here's the, the next one, which... Um, You've got the again. Think about that earlier image that we had. Uh, so now you have, um, you know, Moroni again with the kind of nimbus of glory around him, and uh, passing the passing the plates to Joseph Smith. Uh, and so, uh, after Joseph organized the Church of Christ in 1830, he and his followers faced persecution in 1832 while living in the home of John and Elsa Johnson in Hiram, Ohio. He was pulled from his bed by a dozen men, beaten and coated with tar and feathers. Um, the saints, this one image, the saints tried to build Zion in Jackson County, Missouri, but their neighbors resented the saints' economic and political clout and religious zeal, destroying their homes and driving them from the county in 1833, and also later from the state in 1838, as we'll see later. So from May to June 1834, approximately 230 men, women, and children marched to Missouri to help the saints who had been expelled. They marched a thousand miles from Ohio. After they arrived in Clay County, a storm arose flooding out mobbers preparing to attack, which was viewed as a miracle. Returning from a, a tense exchange between Missouri settlers and saints, a group of men from Jackson County planned to raise a force to resist Zion's camp. A small ferry sank, killing five of the men. You see the dramatic uh, lightning there. Um, okay, so then we have, um, okay, after the saints settled in Caldwell and Davies counties, troubles flared up again in 1838. Three members were captured by enemies, and a paramilitary force rescued them in a battle at Crooked River. Several died, including Apostle David Patton. On October 27th, Governor Lilburn Boggs declared the Mormons should be that the Mormons should be exterminated or driven from the state. A state militia of 240 men attacked the little community of Hans Mill. And we talked about that killing 17 men and women and children. 
Okay, now this, this is illustrating in greater detail than that other image we showed earlier, state troops surrounding the largest settlement of far west Missouri. So the saints agreed to give up their arms and leave the state. George Hinkle was a colonel in the Missouri uh, militia and uh, Latter-day Saint High Council who negotiated to turn in Joseph Smith. So that was a controversial act. Joseph and others were imprisoned in the Clay County Jail at Liberty, Missouri for four and a half months, despite the bitterly cold weather and unpleasant circumstances, they sent several revelatory letters to the saints. Christensen himself was imprisoned in Norway for preaching the gospel, so he would have re resonated with that. With Joseph in prison, Brigham Young and other apostles took charge to help the saints make an exodus from Missouri during the winter of 1838 to 39, trudging through the mud and snow. In the early 1840s, Joseph Smith sent missionaries to groups of the Lakota, Potawatomi, and other tribes. About 100 representatives from tribes neighboring Nauvoo, including the Sauk and Meskwaki, sought out Joseph Smith and re requested religious instruction and political alliances. Joseph preached to a large group on August 12, 1841, in a grove near Nauvoo and shared the Book of Mormon promises regarding them, as, he, as the, the quote is, the despised remnants of a once splendid race. Uh, uh, then Joseph asked for the state of Illinois for military protection, and they organized the Nauvoo Legion. Here he is shown inspecting the troops. After in ordering the destruction of a printing press and arrested for, um, for that and other um, charges, Joseph and Hiram Smith were imprisoned. Will Willard Richards and John Taylor were also present. The mob shot Hiram Smith, then John, then John Taylor and Joseph Smith. Hit by gunfire, Joseph fell from the upper window into the yard. Christensen painted an unsubstantiated story of a man about to cut Joseph Smith with a knife when he was paralyzed. That is, that's the, again, that, that shaft of light uh, indicating that. After Joseph's death, leaders disputed who should lead the church, perhaps suggested by the darkening clouds. Work on the Nauvoo temple continued, suggested by the sun breaking through the clouds. And pressured by mobs, some Latter-day Saints began evacuating Nauvoo even before the temple dedication, while others chose to stay. Two years after the Western Exodus, an arsonist set fire to the temple on the night of October 9th, 1848. So a devastating loss. Okay, this is showing Brigham Young's group heading west to the Upper California by late 1846. It was so cold that the Mississippi froze and wagons crossed on the ice. By, septem by September 1846, only about 700 saints were left in Nauvoo, many too poor or sick to travel. Attacked by 800 vigilantes, the saints' defense collapsed and they negotiated to leave. Of course, as I said earlier, many chose to stay. Um, so, so people viewed this as a modern miracle when uh, the poor camp, camp of saints was crowded into tents and they were, they were hungry and, a flo and uh, flocks of quail landed in the camps providing food for the refugees. So the saints wintered in temporary settlements in Iowa and Nebraska. The largest of these was in Omaha, winter quarters where some 3,500 people lived. And you can see how they, this is an important piece of art because it showed kind of the arrangement of the um, cabins and so forth. Um, in the spring of 1847, a vanguard company of pioneers set out to blaze a westward trail and select a valley in which to settle. Notice that the uh, oxen rather than horses would have been more common. So that's just a sort of a historical quibble. So Brigham Young looked over the Great Salt Lake Valley on July 24th, 1847, declared this is the right place. This, the panorama that CCA Christensen painted was stored away after his death. Many years later, it was discovered and brought back to light. Um, to light. It is now housed at the BYU Museum of Art. And so, um, so we're going to wrap up our presentation now with one more panorama. You guys are so good to, to watch this. I hope this is enjoyable for you. I, I love these art scenes. So this one is an interesting one. It is a large panorama, kind of like the ones we talked about before, but it's lost. It exists only as those slides. Um, that we talked about earlier. Okay, so this first scene uh, will be, uh, some of you will know this, know this art. This is uh, the William W. Phelps um, printing press and the Gilbert Whitney store that were attacked um, on July 20th, 1833, and uh, also the tarring and feathering of Edward Partridge and Charles Allen. Um, and I, I'll say it was inspiring to me to go downtown of Independence and look at some of these 
locations that are so so significant and um, uh, Hancock would would have been very young at the time and so he was describing uh, but but some of the others the other saints knew these these buildings would have been able to help him with some some detail you can see the Gilbert store in the in the back back or in the right in the center of the of the um, image okay so this scene is kind of a funny one um i mean it's a sad one but but look at how the children are stacked you know front to back front to back front to back on these oxen and this is uh, showing solomon hancock um who was a appointed to serve a mission to missouri in june 1831 he lived in jackson county missouri by 1833 and fled with his family in November to Clay County, where he's appointed to the Zion High Council in 1834. After his first wife died, he married Phoebe Adams, and he moved to Caldwell County. He served as a member of the Zion High Council in Far West, and so he just got pushed from place to place. He, his family escaped from hostilities in Missouri and settled in Illinois. Phew, finally safe. No, not. He became the president of the Yelrome branch. Yelrome, of course, is morally spelled backwards, and so, um, so he was part of the the mob, uh, evac um, he was evacuated when mob persecutions hit later. So um, in this in this uh, scene right here, um, wait a minute, get this right scene. Okay, I, I'm going to hit this one now. We've already talked about this one a little bit. This is very similar to the one we already talked about, with, but it looks like that might be Will Willard Richards in the, in the window. He looks very huge, <laughs> but... Uh, that's going, okay, so this is the one I wanted to show you. In 1845, when mobs threatened to destroy the saints in Yelrome, Brigham Young advised, advised Solomon Hancock, it is wisdom for you to remove the women and children from Yelrome as fast as you can. We think it best to let them burn up our houses while we take care of our families. Employ the best scribe you have, or half a dozen of them if necessary, to pen minutely all the movements of the enemy. Solomon's home was built, burnt to the ground, as many others were. He and his family resided in Nauvoo for a season before being forced once more to flee for their safety to Iowa. They traversed the hills of Iowa, stopping at temporary encampments before reaching Council Bluffs. Solomon died on, on December 2nd, 1847, near Council Bluffs at age 54. Okay, so um, this is the, the showing the uh, Isaac Morley home. Uh, they had moved to Illinois and settled the, the Morley settlement or Yalrome. Uh, and he enjoyed peace in the settlement till September 1845 when mobs attacked the community. Edmund Durfee was shot and killed by a mob. The saints fled to Nauvoo for safety. In the fire that encircled the community, Isaac lost his home, cooper shop, and grain. Isaac and his family knew, moved to Nauvoo. From there, they trekked across Iowa on the, on the plains on their journey to the west. Okay, on September 10th, 1846, a militia of a thousand men attacked Nauvoo. They had guns, cannons, and a singular purpose to drive the Mormons from the state. On September, uh, uh, so, and then an anti-Mormon militia made at least one last push to drive them out. Fearing such an account, the saints had fortified the city and built breastworks along major roads, calling themselves the Spartan Band. According to some sources, they fortunately had a few repeating rifles, thanks to the, to the ingenuity of Jonathan Browning, famous for Browning guns, and built a cannon out of a steamboat shaft. They armed 150 men to fight a mob of 1,000. As the militia approached the city, both sides exchanged artillery fire before battling with small arms. Inside the besieged city, a lookout watched from the Nauvoo Temple bell tower and reported on the battle to the women and children huddled below. At least three saints were killed and several injured. Casualties on the anti-Mormon side are unclear, but several were injured. The saints eventually beat back the militia. Each day, the militia regrouped and returned, each time being repelled. The saints also reported to guerrilla tactics, but eventually they, they knew they could not withstand, and on, on September 16th, they surrendered. They were given five days to pack their belongings and head west. Um, and so we have um, just a few more images now. Before the saints left Nauvoo, President Young assigned Jesse Little to ask the U.S. government to help with immigration. Little sent a letter to U.S. President James Polk. The letter detailed the Saints' plans to travel over the Rocky Mountains and settle in Mexican territory. It also contained a warning. If they did not receive help from the U.S. government, they would be willing to accept his assistance from rival governments. So uh, Polk saw an opportunity. He said, let's recruit uh, 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 forces from the Mormons and uh, basically had 500 or so men um to uh, sign up and march to california so this is this is kind of a neat scene they they put together two big poles 
um, when they reached uh, Los Angeles and uh, had a July 4th celebration. Uh, they had a 13-gun salute. Um, that would have been quite surprising. You know, the, you know the, the basically there were it was kind of a contested uh, territory, and so that was basically an affirmation. This, this California belongs to the the U.S. Okay, so we're going to wrap up with these three slides here. So these are really interesting slides to me because they are some of the earliest depictions of settler and indigenous population in Utah. And this is a relation to the Walker War. Um, so the Walker War really grew out of um, decades of, uh, well, in this case, a, a decade of um, um, aggressive colonization efforts. Um, there had been uh, their own, the Timpanogos tribe had been exterminated from Utah County, but they, they were still hanging in there. And um, um, Chief Walker um, said he had always been opposed to the whites settling on his lands and the whites want everything and will, will give the Indians nothing. They were an, at an impasse. Tensions were at a high the dry grass needed only a spark. So on July 15, 1853, members of the Timonogos tribe were trading fish uh, or trout for flour that the settlers had. And one of the natives gave um, uh, his wife a beating when he felt like the trade wasn't fair. So James A. Ivy intervened and said, you know, don't do that. And basically there's altercation the, the, the gun came apart that, 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 that was there. And so um, there were, um, Ivy hit, hit the man with the, the gun stock and killed him. And so that was all it needed to, for, the, for them, the, the native tribes, the indigenous people to say, we want a life for life. And um, what's shown here is in the middle, right there is Charles Hancock, who is the Bishop in Payson, who gathered with the people with um, Wakara and Petit Neat and Arapine and said, um, we're, we're, they, they were able to achieve uh, peace for a day. And so uh, Hancock said, I'm gonna go talk with Brigham Young, figure out what we're gonna do. Um, he, he went the 150 mile uh, trip and did not return in time. Um, and so basically there was a uh, retribution. Um, Alexander Kiel was, uh, was killed. And so basically it just launched a lot of, um, of warfare um, for, for several years till it was settled on 1854. Um, then we have here uh, another scene related to this. Early in the morning of the 26th of September, 1858, um, uh, let's see, I forgot the year right, 53, sorry, 53, Hancock and a group of militia surprised the Timpanogos who had committed some depredations. Hancock began peace negotiations when his superior officer arrived and ordered them to surrender. Hancock was shot in the head, but survived. And so that's uh, that's an interesting thing. So he would have had uh, feelings about that. Um, and then in this final scene, um, you have the, uh, this was a, a farmhouse that was created in the Spanish Fork. There used to be a huge uh, Indian reservation um, there near Spanish Fork. The marker is still there today. Uh, and uh, Indian agent Garland Hurt had started three farms. This is the, uh, the farm with its main building. And as the Utah War was breaking out in 1857, Charles Hancock and others thought Hurt was stockpiling weapons to attack the Saints, so they pressured Hurt to leave. So these images, these rare images, what do they do? I think these panoramas tell these stories of faith, and fortitude and persecution and persistence that are really unique that, that we need to understand. They also depict the earliest Book of Mormon scenes and to show how the Bible and Book of Mormon work together to share a unified uh, testimony of Christ, and including the, uh, the how the atonement and the crucifixion are so, so uh, central to the message of the Bible. They also show the difficulty of settling the West and, um, and these, uh, these complicated relations and finally, they depict the indigenous people's transition from nomadic foragers to farmers and, and, that, and the, the tension that existed at that time. So as CCA Christensen says, and this is my last quote, history will preserve much, but art alone can make the narrative of the suffering of the saints comprehensible for eternity. And I hope that you've enjoyed um, this presentation of these panoramas, and I look forward to your questions. Also, I wanna give just a little plug in closing. Uh, for this Book of Mormon art catalog that launched um, last week. Uh, this is really an amazing resource, and it includes some of these scenes, uh, definitely the CCA Christensen uh, Book of Mormon art, and um, it's free to use. There's no cost, 
And so uh, it's it's worth seeing. So uh, if there's, if, I hope that's a, a welcome resource. Uh, again, just launched last week and, it, and you'll really enjoy looking at these scenes. So thank you very much. Let's have some, let's have some questions or comments or tell me if there's a particular slide you'd look at, like to look at or discuss. Thank you. Uh, first of all, express my appreciation and, and then ask you to go back to the beginning because most of my questions are early on. Great. First one actually is with your St. Louis slide. Good. This is Mountain City. And your, your artist doesn't put any mountains in. Yes. So, so what, would you repeat that? Okay. St. Louis was known as Mountain City. And on the other hand, we have Cahokia with Monk's Mound still standing and a few others. But, uh, but uh, St. Louis was Mountain City. And until about the turn of the century, wow. there were homes there that were being chopped down and utilized. And St. Louis was being built. But by the time that this is uh, portrayed, one would think the mounds ought to still be showing. Wow, isn't that interesting? Yeah, Mound City. Uh, uh, okay, so I'm just uh, I'm learning a little bit more of that as we're talking. Uh, I I told Paul I'm gonna I bet the first question that comes up I'm gonna be stumped. Um, so, um, so let's see. Well, then we, we've already fulfilled that, so maybe we should go ahead and go to Monty. <laughs> okay, that's okay, fun. Monty. Go ahead. I just had a quick question. Are any of these uh, artistic reproductions av available at the Mormon Visitor Center? That is a great question. In in Missouri, in Independence? yes, uh, I do not know the answer. I bet they are not. Um, the only one I can think of that's a possibility is this uh, General Joseph Smith addressing the Nauvoo Legion, but I I haven't been there. That I know is in the the original is in the church history library in Salt Lake City, but I don't know if they have a reproduction in Independence. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Devin, there's a couple comments. Um, Aspie, Hi. who is our uh, regular from Belgium, uh, said it was a good presentation, a real good presentation, and he thanks you. Um, and then there was a question about um, uh, from Russ. He said he enjoyed it a ton. Does the BYU uh, MOA plan and exhibit. Oh, what a fantastic idea. Uh, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, but I think that's worth pursuing. Um, let me uh, let me see if I can talk with my contact there at the MOA and, and see if they, because that is a, that would be really significant. Okay. And Aspie is asking if, um, it would be possible to have the PowerPoint available, oh, yeah. um, not PDF, but the PowerPoint. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you can send it to Robert, and Robert has a way to get that out to everybody. Okay. Uh, will you remind me Robert's um, email? Email. Well, you can just do that offline if you want. But I can type it in the uh, chat if you would like. That would be very helpful because I could share it. It's a huge file. It's uh, it's a hundred megabytes, but I'm sure that we can um, compress that a little bit. Yeah, it's a. Um, these are really interesting images. I'm glad you like them because they're. I, I thought this is a nerdy group. They'll they'll really like this history because it's really interesting about the the Book of Mormon art and also the the connections between our restoration movements because we all kind of we converge at, at Nauvoo and then we split off and so like half the story is is west and half the story is in the midwest so yeah it's it's very important to have these connections Deb are you muted yeah Paul has his hand up and then Frank go ahead Paul please I'd like for you to go back to the Robert Campbell painting of the of the uh, uh, Joseph Smith on the stand Yes. That, oh, that, yes. Right there. Yes, that one is uh, one so significant that I have studied it in detail because when we excavated the Joseph Senior and Lucy Max Smith double log house, it's the one on the right, and uh, you can see the the stand, uh, which is the focal point uh, closer to the right center, 
that stand has now been reconstructed and we used it in 2019 for uh, reenactment of this, uh, of this uh, uh, day of the militia gathering to hear Joseph Smith. And we had a marvelous presentation by descendants of, uh, of Mr. Green, who was the marshal, and uh, Hiram. Uh, let's see, it was well, the four, uh, four of the people, I believe, that were there uh, representing their ancestors uh, were, were in costume. And so beautiful chance to, to replicate history. And so I, I want to give special emphasis because this painting is extremely useful. It does, you notice, elevate the artist. And so I think that it's actually from the second floor of the smokehouse, which was used by Joseph Smith uh, temporarily as an office. And, uh, and the, you know, by measuring the distance between the posts and by uh, working out the actual alignments, we found that they actually lined up with the foundation footings of the of the uh, bar and barber shop built there for Porter Rockwell. Wow! So this would have been the construction uh, materials for Porter Rockwell's bar and barber shop that Joseph Smith and the other gentlemen are standing on. Wow! Fascinating. That is a really cool insight. What else do, you, do you, have you learned? I mean, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I'll bet you know more. <laughs> well, notice that big brown thing behind them. Yeah. There was a significant amount of debate about that, but I'm pretty confident that's actually the roof of Joseph Smith's stable. Wow. So far uh, away. So. If, you, if you'll notice uh, too that, that on the Joseph and Lucy Max Smith log house, uh, the picture cuts across or appears to cut across at about the door. And it was a double log house. And when we excavated the footprint, it was 25 by 40 feet. And so this poor archaeologist was proposing a double log house that big, and nobody would accept the idea that a log house would be that big. Wow. And then we found one uh, reconstructed on the Living History Farm in Des Moines, which had been moved there from northern Missouri, and it had the same footprint. And wow. it's two uh, one rod square sections with, with a half rod dog run in between. And so that doorway would have been marking that dog run. Wow, incredible. But you have other hands. Let's go ahead and give the other people a chance. Okay, Frank, and then Ron Smith. Go ahead, Frank. Yes, I just wanted to thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, and I wanted to make one comment about the uh, file compression. I doubt that you can get it compressed small enough that it can come across uh, email. I suggest maybe try to put it in something like Dropbox or uh, otherwise, if you do get it compressed down where it will go through the email, you're going to lose a lot of a lot of quality in the in the pictures. So uh, if you could get it in a Dropbox to uh, Robert, that would be the best probably. Good. Love it. That's a good suggestion. And I see it seen from Aspie su suggesting use of WeShare. I have not used that, but I will we'll experiment with this. I'd love to share this with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the easy thing about the V-Share, it's a, it's a program uh, running on the web. You just upload your file there, and then you have a way to send it to several persons. And you have another option, it's to create a link. And if you create a link and you share the link with, with the persons you want the file to, to have, everybody with the link, can access your file and it will not be compressed in any way because there's no way you are, you will uh, hit the limit of uh, VShare. It can handle upon, uh, well, I do uh, slideshows of, of about uh, 200 slides and I always use uh, VShare for this. So no problem over there. Love Thank it. you. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, Aspie. That's great. I, I have not heard of that either. So Devin, I will look forward to working with you. You can see that this is like the Tower of Babel, right? <laughs> uh, and we'll, we'll see if we can find a common language. Okay? I love that. That's great. Ron Smith, you have a question. 
Yeah, um, I was just this kind of an aside. I was interested in the death masks. Yes. Um, if you could go back there. Absolutely. Whoops, this way, this way. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming that, well, which one's Joseph and which one's Hiram? <laughs> just a, uh, Joseph on the left. Left, Hiram that's what right. I thought. Hiram's uh, chin uh, in that particular one was damaged, and so they had to reconstruct it. There is another set of masks called the pedestal masks, which are a little bit more original, they think. And so it's got a slightly different chin. I think it's got a little, even a little cleft in the chin, if I remember right. But just yeah. so you can, yeah. So, well, that was what I was going to ask about was uh, was the reconstruction on the chin. So, so were these actual death masks that were used, or is this somebody's reconstruction? I mean. <laughs> I'll tell you what I know, and I'm going to ask it and lean on you if you know this for sure. I had read one place that Philo had had this these copied, and so um, I, I, I that is one thing I've heard. And then I've also heard this discussion that that they're pretty original. So I know there's these pedestal uh, masks as well, um, and uh, I also know that these these have changed hands a few times. That this these particular masks went to. Wilfred Wood at his museum for a while, and um, and then they're later donated to the uh, Church History Library. So um, I, they're pretty they're pretty original. They're they're maybe one generation away from the original, you know, the actual um, um, original death masks. Um, and these are very significant because, as you've seen this. Uh, watch locket with a daguerreotype that um, is possibly Joseph Smith that we've heard about from Locke Mackay. Um, they've been looking at this very closely. Now, they several people have pointed out this is Joseph and Hiram. This is the closest we have to Joseph and Hiram after they were dead while they were in heat in Nauvoo. So th that is a significant um, um, uh, caveat that it's not exactly what they look like, They're, you know, um, but it's pretty, you know, as close as close as we have to their yeah. actual facial expressions, I guess. Yeah, thank you. And but um, and what is the uh, is that plaster or is it uh, what what's the material? Plaster. Yeah, plaster. plaster. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're thank welcome. You. Yeah, they're they're fascinating masks and uh, uh, get you closer. To that feeling, um, uh, I, I, you may know this, you may not know this, but um, they used these as well to kind of look at the facial structures and ultimately concluded that Joseph and Hiram were misidentified where they were buried ultimately. So, jo so it's Emma, Hiram, and Joseph, and that's a that's an interesting um, thing that, that some of you, you uh, uh, know, and, and some of you may not know. But I thought that was. An that was interesting. Hey, Frank, go ahead, please. Let me respond on, on that, uh, Frank, before you jump in, because uh, there's a, still a good deal of controversy over whether we have uh, Emma and Joseph adjacent in the burial or if it's Emma and Hiram. Okay, well, that's a fair. That's a fair comment. Locke Locke Mackay is pretty sure, but but you know that's that's a good point. That's it may be still controversial. The fact that I was that we were able to send pictures to uh, to Jane Bikestra uh, to ask which one limped means that we're getting good information back in terms of the legs. Now, if we get the legs tied to the faces correctly, then we'll have good answers. Good, good, excellent. Jane Bikestra is a human osteologist and. Uh, She's one of the few people in the world that has established her own discipline in human osteology. That's uh, right. Was she she was referred to at the J John Whitmer, right? I think that they talked about that. Yeah. Right. Tremendous. Okay, you finished, Paul. Thank you, Frank. Go ahead. Yeah, Frank. You're welcome, Paul. Um, I just wanted to uh, point out that I had uh, I had an opportunity to see the uh, uh, photographs of the skulls and the bones of, of both Joseph and Hiram uh, at, the, at our museum. There's, there are negatives there and they're large. 
Um, and the I'd also read that uh, uh, when Joseph fell from the window, his jaw was broken and shoved backward to some extent or up upward. Uh, and so that it kind of made the uh, paintings of Joseph from these death masks uh, make him look like he had a, a different kind of jaw, lower jaw from uh, in, in the pictures that have been made since then uh, right. based on these death masks. Right. So, I, you know, I can't verify that because I can't show you anything, but uh, I've seen the the uh, skulls and and the jaw was broken away. So, yeah, that that makes sense. Uh, these are close to what they would have looked like, but because of that damage, uh, would be a little bit different, just just slightly different with the, the the jaw break. Yeah, good point. You did say that Joseph was on the left in these pictures. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I think that means it's my turn again. Okay. Uh, please, uh, I I would like for you to go back to the Far West picture. Far West, coming, coming your way. I was curious about two things. If I read that correctly, and and the vantage point is looking east over the temple site, or, or can you verify that? I don't know the answer to that. If so, then Joseph and Emma's house would have been to the lower right. Oh, interesting. Um, I find it very curious that, that to me, one of the most significant stories coming out of there was Joseph being fastened in a wagon and only being able to get his hand out to uh, touch members of his family as he was being hauled away to prison. Interesting. Wagon here. And there's a wagon there. That's really that's really intriguing. Okay. Yeah. That, that I would, like that imagery. That, that imagery would, would strike me as being the the most pertinent in, in an imagery to portray. Or, I like that. And and I'm going to comment on that. I I like that very much, Paul. And sometimes um, when these artists, these panorama artists in particular, would take the scenes, they would kind of they would take the history. And they would include some details like that that would that they could then use as a talking point because they'd say, "Hey, look, here's a wagon. Let's talk about this." And so I I can believe that as a as a deliberate act because um, they they would often use these symbols in several of CCA Christensen's art. Uh, he would use two or three um, images that were days apart or a week apart and say, "Well, I know these didn't happen the same day, but let's talk about them all together." And so they would they would combine these images in one one scene because it was economical rather than have paint two different scenes. All right. James Lucas has his hand up. Go ahead, James. James. Uh, just to uh, get some context, uh, did I understand correctly that? Uh, these are part of a uh, a large catalog or a book that you've published. Oh, I noticed okay. at the uh, uh, Book of Mormon Studies Association this last weekend. I unfortunately uh, there was a presentation about that by Jenny Shampoo. Yes, Shampoo. Shampoo. As I, uh, I, oh, okay, and but unfortunately it was a concurrent session, and yeah. I, I felt I had to go to the uh, another session, so I didn't. Uh, find out about it. So it, could you just yeah. give us some background? Is this yeah. a, a book, a catalog, uh, a, or what? Um, that's a great a project. That's a great question. Okay, so um, I don't have this book here, uh, but um, some, some years ago, they did have an art exhibit. And uh, as a result of that, uh, Richard Ullman and Richard Jensen uh, no relation. I'm actually Richard Jensen too, <laughs> but um, but he's he's Danish and I'm Norwegian. Um, I, I go by my middle name Devon. Um, so so they created a a, a, a catalog, a, a little book that had several of these images. Not all of them. I, I would add these. Some of them were in there and some of them were not. 
And uh, I, I just went really snoop uh, and then it had all of these images of the Mormon panorama. Uh, and it was kind of um, representing these pieces as part of the uh, Museum of Art um, uh, exhibit. So, uh, so a lot of these images are part of that. This particular one, this particular combination is, is, is mine. It's not part of a book. Um, I, you know, it's, it, that's a really intriguing uh, idea, whether that be, there'd be enough interest to do another book, because there are, some of these images are, some of these are not very well known. And this discussion, of course, is, is unique. But, um, and, and, oh, I want to just add to my friend col colorized some of these images of the indigenous uh, folks, and I thought that added some um, explanation. So back to your question about this catalog. So Jenny uh, Shampo did include several of those Book of Mormon scenes in her in her catalog, which I was grateful to. I provided them to her and um, and I got them from the church and they're they're sort of they, they told us you can use these. We, you don't have to. You know, this is this is something you can just share with other people. So those those images are part of this. I'll tell you what I know about Jenny's um, presentation. She basically said she was um, trying to do an article uh, uh, showing the, the various Book of Mormon art resources, and she found that it was really hard to find them in one location. So she said, let's create a website. So that's what this represents, um, exploring this Book of Mormon art from all over. And it has nice filters on it. And that's what she was talking about is how you can filter and you can say, okay, I want this by year. I want this by the type of art this is. And um, and so forth, and so uh, it's done with I think uh, in, in connection with the Neil A. Maxwell Institute at BYU. Um, I believe they funded it. But Betty, yeah, it's a it's a wonderful resource. Yeah, I hope you'll check out. So short answer. I know that was wordy. I don't have a book, but some of these images appeared in an earlier book. But this Book of Mormon uh, resource is really helpful in, in showing some of them. We are fortunate. There's the website. Tonight. And Jenny is on, and she has posted um, a link in the chat, so you'll want to jump back. And Jenny, uh, if you would like to add to that, I think that people would be uh, uh, interested in, to hear more. She's done really remarkable work, and uh, I'm in her fan club. So that is a so the main uh, project is this website, and this is a, a source of it. But the website includes other other uh, artwork of Book of Mormon scenes? Absolutely. Or is the focus of the website Book of Mormon scenes? Yes, the focus of Jenny's site is Book of Mormon scenes, and it's it's much more expansive than my presentation. Okay, thank you. Okay. Now I see Monty, did, did you no longer need your hand up, Monty? Well, it's, it's kind of uh, non sequitur. What I had to say was uh, that one image that Paul was commenting about of of uh, those men standing before that giant army. Oh yeah. Far west. You know, the 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 guys that were standing out front from the, you know blocking the community from the army that was invading. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean uh to me I I said well that would be one situation in which I would experience mighty prayer. Oh yes. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> yeah I mean uh Every one of those guys probably understood what it meant to uh, feel like George Armstrong Custer. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Very, very, very tender uh, feelings uh, being, being with that many militia people right now outside the uh, outside the city. I'd be looking at my neighbor going, whose idea was this? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Looks like Carol, you got your hand up. Go ahead, Carol Kosowski. Carol, you on mute. Unmute. There you are. Am I coming through? Yep. It's good. I've got a few questions. Um, first one is the expulsion from Nauvoo that was painted by Hancock. Yes. I noticed there, was he under a pressure to get this painting out because he has a half a, a half a head, a half a man. It shows a half a man there. Great. The, I think it was the fifth from the last painting. Is this the one? No. Oh, yes, yes, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, that was. 
Excuse yeah. me. Oh, you're right. Oh, okay, let's see. Either toward the right of the scene, yeah. there is a hat and a head, but no body. Yeah, the, it's really, really light. Uh, that is a really good question. Now, I will tell you this one. I am. It's it's just a different art style than the rest of the uh, the rest of the art, and so. I'm not quite sure what to make of it. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I will tell you this. I, it says designed and executed by C.B. Hancock. So I'm fairly sure it was part of his uh, exhi exhibition, but I just, I don't know who painted that and why they would have. And I don't know if it's maybe faded. Um, you it kind of, cause you can see the outline of the clothes. You can see the buttons on there. But there's something off about that image, and it, uh, yeah, it's 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 there's something the colors are not right, or it's not finished, or something. Yeah, that's a good observation. Keen eye. Also, the position of the horse is um, from another famous painting. I believe it's from Napoleon, or Napoleon or George Washington. So he is taking pieces of other artists or other images. And right. using like the position of the horse and stuff, I see some other horses' positions are Good. from other art. Good, I so, agree. And then Joseph Smith, um, I studied the derogatype that was uh, from Locke McKee. Yes. And uh, I struggle with it terribly because of the high cheekbones. I've yes. done a lot of, I've done portraits. I've done a lot of portraits. Yes. And the high cheekbones just don't look like Joseph. Now, if Joseph were to, I mean, the images that are best to me is this one. Yes. I don't know if you can see it from the glare. Yes. yes. Where he doesn't have a whole lot of high cheekbones. Yes. And this image plus a few images from him comes from this book. I don't know if Doug McFarland is still on here, but uh, Doug McFarland gave it to me. And these were images from Sutcliffe Maudsley, who lived back in that time. And where this painting came from, the same place, Makokoda, Maudsley is buried in Makokoda. Oh. So a lot of his images I've studied, very interesting. And it would explain why in the masks that the cheekbones were so high as in comparison to what Maudsley seen who had seen Joseph firsthand. Right. So that, that would explain a lot of that. It could be. So I struggled that with that being an, a real picture of Joseph. Right. And also the age, because the age in the derogatype is quite old in comparison to Joseph's age, 30, 38, when he died. Right. So, and he looks like he's about 50 something in the derogatype. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, what about Arnold Freiburg? Yeah. Do you have any images from him or how does he fit in on the Book of Mormon um, art? Great question. So uh, Arnold, uh, well, if Jenny's on, she probably knows even more about Arnold than I do. <laughs> I'm I'm a generalist uh, on 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 him. So uh, so Jenny, are you available? Or are you is, is Jenny still here? Hi, yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Would you add anything about Arnold Freeberg? Um, and I'm sorry, you might hear my son doing his piano lesson in the background here. Is, this is panoramas were set to music. That's great. Okay. <laughs> Now, sorry, what's the question on Freeberg? Uh, what, about when did he paint and uh, how did he, what was his motivation um, to contribute to the art? I mean, his connection with uh, an exhibit, right? Yeah, so he was painting um, his well-known series of 12 Book of Mormon paintings um, in the early 1950s. And he was commissioned by Adele Cannon House, who's the, um, she at the time was the primary, the general primary president of the church. And she wanted um, some illustrations to be used um, in the Children's Friend magazine um, that the church put out for children. And so they had originally conceived of doing one illustration each month. So that's why there are 12 of them. Um, how he settled on those particular 12 images we're not totally sure, but we know that he was um, in communication with church leaders and with Adele 
Um, yeah, does that does that help a little bit? A little bit. I was wondering where he, why they chose him. I mean, he's a fantastic artist, but that's probably why. And he was probably came with a fantastic. Uh, price too. <laughs> Some of his art, he did uh, Washington, George Washington praying next to his horse, the mm -hmm. special horse. And I have another question for um, Devin, please. Um, in you. one of your your um, art, one of your paintings that you shown had it was colorized by a Josh Christensen. Yes. Is he any relation to? the Danish artist that you spoke about before. That is, is a Josh coloring um, Hancock's or um, yeah, Hancock's art. Was he like the son of? That is a great question to my knowledge. No, I asked him, I asked him if he's related and he said he, he's not aware uh, of a connection uh, with CCA Christensen. Yeah, but, uh, but he does, he does that just for fun on the side and, and it's, you know, it's an approximation of the color that might have uh, been in the original. I, I don't. He's he's done some work that's that's kind of interesting. But and he said he did it fairly quickly. Um, but uh, he's got some some color tool that kind of does it automatically. So it's um, not purely artistic reproduction of what it would have looked like. I see. You can see the. Um... Uh, the learning process by Christensen, because the first ones that you showed us were of watercolors, and then he advanced to oil. So it was oh. neat to see him um, grow artistically. Yeah, I love that. That's okay, good... thank you. I'll let somebody else talk now. <laughs> thank you so much for those questions, Carol. And thank you, Jenny, thank you, also for uh, weighing in. Uh, Jenny is a, a really an art historian. And so, um, you know, I, I she's just terrific. Yes, and we thank you, Jenny, for your contribution. Um, I'd like to go back to another question, if I may, about uh, relationships, because you have Charles Hancock here. Yep. And Levi Hancock lived yep. with Joseph and Emma. I'm wondering if Charles and Levi related. Well, yes. How? I don't know. Uh, I may have to look at that, but uh, Charles and I believe Solomon and Levi were connected on that. I don't know the answer to that. We, uh, I may have, that may have to come to another day. Let's see, Solomon. Well, let me add another footnote then. Uh, um, I just read the other day that, that uh, Levi Hancock took his son, Mosiah, who probably, I think, uh, 10 or 12 years old. Yeah. The mansion house after the... 10,000 people or so had filed by the uh, bodies of Joseph and Hiram. And since he was a neighbor, they let him in. Wow. He, uh, Levi had uh, Mosiah swear to take uh, vengeance on those that had killed the prophet and his brother. Wow. And to, find, to find that uh, oath and that commentary, you know, the simple fact that your neighbors were allowed to get in after five o'clock. Um, <laughs> I, that, that was astounding enough for me, but then to get the oath as well was sort of fascinating. But uh, apparently not good about it, but apparently quite a lot of, of Mormons did take an oath to get avenge, uh, to avenge the death of Joseph Iron. That's right. That was part of, I, I don't think this is confidential. That was part of the original uh, temple, uh, sorry, not the original. That was part of Brigham Young's uh, era of the temple ceremony. They would uh, they would avenge the the blood of the prophets, and and so yeah, it was uh, that was discontinued later, um, and uh, gratefully, I think that we don't want to be practicing vengeance. <laughs> um, to answer your other question, uh, uh, Solomon and Levi were brothers, so that was that was a that was I was trying to remember what the relationship was, and so yeah, they were brothers. Well, I have more questions, and so uh, <laughs> I'll try to give other people a chance, but I, I, I recognize that, that I am full of them, and so therefore, here, here you go. Uh, curious about the, uh, the Adam and Eve presentation. Yeah. Well, if you go back to that one. I will. 
why would Adam and Eve be blonde? Yeah, so uh, I, I think that's an excellent question. So basically, uh, I think I'm going to say an artistic principle, which is we paint what we know. And so um, uh, you notice that the Dutch um, uh, masters, when they paint people of Christ, they look very Dutch. And so um, I think when you see CCA Christensen, he's got some Scandinavian Adam and Eve. Um, uh, and I'll just make some comments about that. Um, when you see uh, a lot of Utah art, you see Scandinavians and Brits everywhere. <laughs> you know, you see uh, uh, a British Jesus. Um, you see, and so, so I think that's what they're doing is they're kind of portraying, they're putting themselves in the art. They're showing the people that they know that um, uh, in the Idaho Falls Temple, um, I, I looked around and I said, wow, that uh, and there was some art in there. And I said, every person in there is white and Scandinavian or British. So, um, and, and so I just found myself going, that's really interesting. Now today, there is more of an effort to make it a global experience. So you'll see in Latter-day Saint temples, you'll see Africans, uh, you'll see uh, Hispanics, and uh, that's a welcome change. But certainly right here, you're seeing, um, you know, Adam and Eve as, as uh, from Norway or, or Denmark or someplace, right? I was intrigued by that because the pageant of Nauvoo for many years, basically a living panorama. <laughs> striking me uh, uh but uh, again there joseph smith was uh, continually portrayed as blonde or or red and always tall and handsome and uh, right. very, very carefully selected right uh we've we've had discussions about how if you were to be representational christ probably would not have looked shampooed um you know and i just fresh out of the blow dryer right <laughs> shampoo commercial look at my hair you know, um, and, and you know, these are things that you think about later on, and you start to say, "Wow, what? What? And maybe the chosen represents a little bit grittier or, or down-to-earth type of portrayal of Christ um, uh, as a uh, you know Palestinian area uh, Jew." Um, and so, yeah, these portrayals are very interesting. How we how we show um, culture. Notice on that one, it was blonde for Abel, but uh, dark haired for no, King. Absolutely. And um, that is, uh, you know, if we're, if we're talking about racial things, um, racial stereotypes, you notice also a little bit um, darker skin. Um, and uh, this, this is a, an interesting stereotype that happens a lot in portrayals. Um, I'm not being critical here. I'm just saying that that's, uh, there, there were very racial, racially present views in the Book of Mormon and also in the, um, and in the per artistic portrayals of people who are viewed as God's uh, elect. Um, there's always discussion about becoming white as the, uh, 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 white or and delightsome. And uh, of course, we're, 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 we're now stepping back from this and saying, we don't know what exactly what that means, but I think that we see through a glass darkly. We think see through our lenses and we say, okay, um, somehow we're trying to make people who look like um, the, the majority um, look like the chosen ones. And then the people who are different somehow are the other. And, uh, you know, again, not being critical, I'm just saying that that's a very human tendency for us to, to look outward and say, um, hmm. How, how are these people different from me? And uh, I love the, um, I will say this, and uh, this is a very big positive, is we've kind of gone to a place where we're seeing racial distinctions as not very important to God. And um, quoting that Book of Mormon scripture, all are alike to God. And we're starting to say, um, you know what, uh, things that were uncomfortable to us in the 1960s or 50s in, in the U.S. are no longer really big, um, important issues to us today. So yeah, I think that I think we're seeing a little bit of that in Cain and Abel. Well, while you have this on, let me highlight that that uh, you have what appear to be the feet of an animal being sacrificed on the near fire, and then melons on the other. 
Oh yeah, right. You've got the uh, the the um, farming sort of a sacrifice, and then the animal sacrifice, right? And so yeah, one is one one sacrifice is acceptable, and one is not. So, and that will be an allegory of the uh, of the farmers taking over from the hunters and gatherers. Right. That's a really interesting insight. I hadn't thought of that, but uh, that's a really intriguing thing. Um, there was a lot of pressure, um, as we talked about, for, you know, um, there just was not enough game, wild game um, and fish to support that sort of lifestyle. So it put incredible pressure for the indigenous people to change their way of life. And that was a many decades sort of um, uh, transition and, and it was uncomfortable and and the people didn't want to just plant seeds and then stay and you know water them or whatever and so they 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 go out for a while and come back and the missionaries would would say wait you have to you just have to be patient and it was not a you know instead of wandering out of nature and going and hunting it was just sitting around and watching their crops grow and so and 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 having a very confi confined area to to um to spend your time so that it was a that was a big dynamic with the um settlers and the indigenous folks and and of course um just like everywhere else in the u.s um indigenous um peoples began to be more and more restricted confined to reservations and that that unfortunate tension and violence uh, erupted between the two groups a lot in utah territory uh, just as it did everywhere else. Um, as I said, that my my one moment of hope is that the Shoshone people said, "Okay, we're ready. We're ready to convert," and they were accepted and um, had farmlands. And so it was a that was a big positive step. Hey, Paul, were you finished? Let Monty get in. Okay, we got Monty and then Aspie. Go ahead, Monty. I guess I already had the mic turned on. Uh, I just wanted to say that this has been a, a really, really nice presentation. It was very edifying and I really appreciate the material that you presented to us. Um, I got in here a little bit late and so I didn't wasn't able to, to uh, get in on everything, but uh, my wife and I are gonna be going through the recording of it and watching the presentation a second time. Uh, on, on a totally different subject, I, I don't want to be disruptive or anything, but I didn't get a chance to say anything. Uh, hi, Rena. Hi. <laughs> How are you doing tonight, hon? I'm just doing it. <laughs> well. Recuperating. Yeah. yeah. Good day on Saturday, shopping and replenish the flowers at church. And uh, she was able to get the flowers arranged. Today, she's exhausted. I bet. <laughs> well, I just wanted to say hi to you before I signed off. I've got to, I've got to go. So I, I just had that little bit to, to say. You have Thank a good you. night, everybody. And uh, it's been wonderful sharing with you again. Thanks, Monty. We'll see you next week. Okay. Okay, Aspie, go ahead, please. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry that there are some cats uh, running around, so, so you might hear this. But my comment is on the coloring of the persons. It's uh, very interesting that uh, the Europeans went to Africa and other uh, countries to colonize them, but always there was a special edition of the Bible, and I have it. Actually, it's called the uh, Negro Bible or the Slave Bible, and all the passages that the native persons over there could interpret, could interpret in their uh, advantage are gone, and all the passages that they must be loyal to their masters until the death are in. So it's a very censored way. And in the same way, uh, all the images, drawings, and things like that 
always will portray a white person since we white uh, did those things. And even if we know that some persons were of African origin, they, they were painted in white. I can prove to this because I have in my possession LDS documents uh, showing the persons uh, all white. And then suddenly some color persons uh, came in, but this came with the change of uh, doctrine. The, in the same way for the Jehovah Witnesses, I do have uh, several editions of the same book. And the only difference between two editions of the book is that on the back cover, you have one, you have all white persons. And in the other uh, edition, you have exactly the same faces of the same composition. Yes. But over there, the white persons uh, certainly are of African origin or are from Asian origin. So this means that by painting in a certain color, uh, it's an expression also of the theology behind uh, the painter. And that's my point, just to give this information. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Aspie. I think that's tremendous. Uh, to see um, more global uh, recognition, more representation by uh, Black and uh, Indigenous and people of color, um, uh, because that's the world we live in, right? <laughs> there was a time where largely it was a European thing, and then uh, actually we know Tahiti Tahitians were some of the most faithful early members, right? And so so it is grateful that uh, we're grateful that we're starting to remember those those connections and uh you know uh i, I um i'm going to say that i've got a friend whose name is Mauli Bonner who's um who's african american and his son was looking at the uh, a picture of christ surrounded by all these angels who are all white and he said why are there no black angels and his Dad was saying, well, there are black angels. And he said, but why aren't they shown? And he said, oh, you're right. And so he said, we need to do better. And so he, it, was a, it was a call and, a, and, a, and an invitation to say, let's have some, let's have some more representation of, uh, of other racial identities in our, in our most wonderful scenes, like angels in heaven. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a growth opportunity. Absolutely. Thanks, Aspie. Carol, go ahead, please. Um, I did want to say thank you for all the work that you put forth doing this. I can imagine how long it took to photograph and uh, explain and find and dig and search. So we do. So I do want to say thank you. And I have one last question. I don't know if you would even know the answer to, but I had the opportunity and the privilege to tour the um, Nauvoo Temple before it was dedicated. And there is some terrific art in the, inside that temple. I don't think it's open to the public anymore. I don't know. But um, my question was, are all, are all the temples, are, are all the Mormon temples have the same art in them? Or are, are, are these originals? Or are they, what, where did this art come from? And is it repeated in every temple? Great question. Um, so the answer is no, they're not duplicates uh, in each temple. Uh, a lot of them have, uh, they, they do have certain, um, uh, I believe, certain choices that are available. And then there are usually some suggestions to have some local representation. For, for example, that Shoshone uh, baptism is unique to Brigham City and Provo. Those are the only two temples I know of that art existing. Um, so, so there is some flexibility there. The temple art is a little bit, um, uh, restricted. I would say they, they have everybody come through and look at, uh, look at the art when they are going through the open house. But for, for the most part, the, the, the restrictions are pretty hard to reproduce such art, uh, outside those, uh, those temple walls. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, it's a, um, 
you know, it's it's really changing in terms of the representation, uh, making it more of a worldwide church, and it's it's very welcome to me. Uh, that's that's a recent change. We're seeing a lot of art changing out. Um, I say in temples that's true. In chapels, there is a lot of vanilla still. <laughs> I mean, if I can just use that term. And so I sometimes wish we were a little bit more diverse in our chapel uh, catalog. Um, but there, you know, it's 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 a, a work in progress. We we have even in our in our church very few apostles from other um, racial backgrounds. We have uh, Garrett Gong, who's uh, Asian. Uh, Chinese, I think, uh, I think he is, but, but, and, and then we've got Brazilian, uh, largely European. So it's pretty much European, European, a little bit of German, a little bit Brazilian, a little bit of Chinese, but not a lot. And now we're starting to see African Americans represented in our, in our quorums as well. So uh, I think Community of Christ and other restoration branches have a little bit more diverse representation in terms of leadership and so anyway, I, I guess that started with art and went into leadership, but um, I do think that they are related because sometimes as you get people who are in those positions, they say, why don't we show some people that are from this area of the world? And so they, they have influence very quickly where everybody else is just like, oh, the, the usual, uh, <laughs> the usual art's good enough for me. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I think that means we're back to me, and I'd like to make one comment about the painting in front of us, because uh, when you first showed it, I was struck by the idea that there's an Egyptian pyramid in the background, and the idea that uh, that whoever the artist is probably would have known that there are pyramidal structures in the Americas, but uh, no pyramids of that shape, and yet here's probably an artistic representation of what they thought a pyramid should look like. And so there it is, but uh, probably not vision for the Americas. Agreed, agreed. Kind of a generic pyramid. Okay, I'd like to go to the Battle of Nauvoo, if we could, please. Yes. Uh, that is gonna be, uh, let's see, we have two scenes. Are you thinking the Hancock one? See, I'm trying to remember which one. Uh, that one. Is that you thinking that one or the other one? This is the one. Uh, yeah, I, neither neither one speaks of the battle as I see it. Okay. Yeah. Good point. Um, <laughs> but then the way I see it is still being revealed. And so let me announce to people that uh, Bob Baxter, the uh, Icarian gentleman from Nauvoo, has asked me to come bring a crew of metal detectors on April 1st to he has gotten permission for us to explore another 100 acres that uh, that was part of the Battle of Nauvoo and a couple of cannonballs have been found there uh, when we have explored just east of Winchester we found a whole bunch of uh, musket balls to show where the lines of defense were and this will be just a little farther east and north of that um, and so been soybeans this past year so by getting there in the spring before the planting is done then uh, we'll have access and with 100 acres it'd be nice if we had several people with metal detectors coming to help with it. the process that we've used there is to have the metal detectors swarm across the field they they don't work together very well they're like cats cannot be herded and so they've all got to go after their own specialties so we let them do that but then they dig up what they find, mark it with a flag, and then we come with the uh, GPS and plot them in and uh, identify what we have and take their photographs. And so the idea here of being able to, to expand our understanding about the Battle of Nauvoo, I think is highly significant. But what we really have learned so far is that we had the, uh, the Carthage Grays coming in from the east. And so that may very well be the people whose campgrounds we'll be working on in April. We had the, uh, the HARP troops coming in from the north. We haven't seen much evidence of them yet. And then from Warsaw, we had the troops coming in from the south. And uh, that's the group that uh, 
I think we found most of the musket balls from when we were working on a few years ago. So there's a good deal of evidence coming up of that one week battle. And, and uh, since I initially approached it, thinking it was all myth, having, having uh, done the archeology span on it this far, then we've got a monograph underway on it. And to me, that's rather exciting, but it'd be nice if they had an actual picture of, of the Eastern part of Nauvoo on it. That's a, that's a fantastic insight. Very exciting. You know, as, as you were suggesting, there are some areas that you think would be really um, richly documented. And this is one that's a little bit lighter. Um, and, and so I look forward to that. You're talking about cannonballs. Uh, Wandel Mace said that they were so low on cannonballs that they would sometimes reuse the cannons, cannonballs that were shot at them. You know, so, um, you know, they were, they just did not have, they were not prepared for a big uh, battle. Further, we found the clusters of the tools from the blacksmith shop that they, that they fired because uh, chisels and, and uh, um, bits and nails that could be fired from, because they made a makeshift cannon yeah. out of the steamboat, as you suggested, yeah. and clusters of those blacksmith shop items in the field uh, across the uh, east of Winchester, across from where that uh, cannon would have been mounted. I love that. So um, what, Paul, you, since you um, have studied this, what are you, what is the best published thing that you can think of on the Battle of Nauvoo that would be interesting to, for people to read more about? There really isn't anything really good about the Battle of Nauvoo yet. Amazing, amazing. I hope to fix that within the next year or so. Oh, that sounds terrific. Uh, there are, Joseph Johnson is probably the historian who has the most information on it. So I would uh, recommend contacting him uh, if you're, well, and, and there are other, there's other people too that have written all monographs, but nothing that's really published uh, that does justice to the whole thing. Um, well, and then as, as I indicated, I, I got into this project thinking that it was mythology. Right. Um, here I dig into it and find that, sure enough, here's cannon or musket balls uh, that line up in the field so that when you plot them in the map, yeah. you can the lines of defense were for both the Mormons and the non-Mormons. Wow, that is fantastic. I am, I am interested to learn more about that. You can see where they came up, where the guys from uh, from Warsaw came up, what became part becomes Parley Street, because there's a valley there, and they're able to come up through that valley out of sight, and the the 30 acres on the east side of uh, of uh, Winchester Street is owned by Charles Tripp, and he gave us permission to work there, and to my astonishment, it looks like a big wide open field, but there are actually valleys that that uh, that the troops could actually a run or walk or crawl up into and get pretty close to the Mormon lines. So it's fascinating to, to examine the terrain and recognize what a remarkable defense it was for the Mormon to hold them off. Undoubtedly, primarily because they had just a few of the uh, Browning repeating rifles. Right, right. Chaotic situation. Errol. Uh, I sent you a message. Okay. Not quite sure how to get it. <laughs> Go to chats. At the bottom of your screen, Carol. Okay. Do you see the word chat? Yes. Should be a nut little one or two next to it. If you click on the chat uh -huh. box. Oh, send my contact information. That's easy. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Paul, as I'm reflecting on this, of course, in relation to the uh, Battle of Nauvoo is the attacks on the uh, in your outlying uh, area. Of course, play into that. Yeah, the Morley settlement that you mentioned is a very interesting one. Tioga, right? Uh, well, and, and yeah, the simple fact that we have these uh, people 
burning. And, and it's interesting that the, uh, the natives have quite a lot of stories about the Mormons stealing their horses and cows and burning that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's very interesting to gather the uh, diverging viewpoints. Well, and I think that it's fair to acknowledge that um, we as people remember things that are in our people's best interest, <laughs> right? So, um, so history is written by the victors. And when you have a victor on one side, they're going to remember things a certain way. And then you have a victor on another side, you're, you're going to say, that's a completely different perspective. And, uh, you know, it's probably somewhere in between. Yeah. Uh, that's the place where archaeologists and historians tend to um, run into each other because yeah. historians are not that fond of being corrected. Right. Right. Artifacts do tell the truth. Right. Right. And uh, and you know, a lot of times we look back at things we we thought we knew ten years ago, fifteen years ago, twenty years ago, and we realize that some of that was a little bit inaccurate, and so. It's, it's healthy to, to be challenged and to kind of look through those biases we have and say, hmm, maybe that's, there's, there's something else I need, I need to learn here. David, get in. Go ahead, David DeBarth. Thank you. A little bit of fun information that I thought Paul would tell, but he didn't on the Battle of Nauvoo when we did the uh, survey there and and found those artifacts. One of the uh, people with their metal detector found an artifact that uh, he thought was a coin, fairly large coin. When we got it into the lab and cleaned it up very thoroughly, we discovered that it was actually a circular piece of pewter. Wow. And it had a dent right in the center of it that a musket ball would fit in perfectly. Wow. You can make your own interpretation of that, but we found that a fascinating artifact. Wow, that suggests that it was uh, at such an angle that it would have been supported. And so, yeah, was that some makeshift armor, <laughs> right? Or was that just happened to be in the right place? That's very fascinating. I love that. Would you say that it was, David? Uh, probably a, uh, a, a water flask, a pewter um, container, huh. but the shell, the, the the cavity just knocked this about one inch uh, circular item out of it with that uh, concavity inside. So yeah, thank you, David, for bringing that up. I I have to highlight um, such interesting stuff that comes out of well, and that that's one of the more convincing kinds of things to speak of a battle. Oh yeah, that's great. Robert Cooks has, has his hand up. Ahead, oh, wait Robert. a minute. And incidentally, that was on the side where that would have been owned by one of the uh, non-Mormons. That's right. Robert. Um, yeah, in terms of the um, uh, Morley settlement, Yale, Rome, Tioga, uh, just a couple of tidbits. One is I fell across a, what looked like a... Um, uh, not a professional publication, but um, a book of, um, gosh, I don't know, maybe about 50 pages, eight and a half by 11, called The 1945 Burning of Morley's Settlement and Murder of Edmund Durfee. So mm -hmm. if, if you're particularly interested in that, I could give you some information on it. And then we have... Um, person here in our area, those of you who know Rex Sandage, uh, he's a descendant of one of the residents of uh, Yale Rome, more loose settlement. Well, yeah, that that is, uh, that's a really good point. And I, I'd love to learn more. I, this, this is one that I knew very little about before I started this. Um, and so I, I'd like to learn more. And, you know, I, this, these slides in particular, I've wondered, is this worth publishing? You know, they, they're not very well known. Uh, I don't consider myself an expert in any of these scenes um, at all. Um, I'm, 
I'm a passable CCA Christensen. Um, Jenny's a lot better than I am, but but I I am interested in in uh, indigenous history. So those are some. I mean, so anyway, I, I haven't I haven't quite figured out what to do with these slides. I mean, I'll happy to share them with you. I just kind of trying to decide. Uh, yeah, what's the next option? I mean, would would this be of interest to maybe John Whitmer Journal or or you know Journal of Mormon History? Anyway, that's that's kind of where I am with this level of things is, is what to do with these next. So, but I, I well, they 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 yeah. performed a useful function in terms of uh, stimulating your interests in all these things, right? Absolutely. I uh, I. For me, I, I'm the kind of person that uh, once I get a mystery, I really have to, I have to solve it. <laughs> uh, I found about Philo Dibble's um, panorama, and I said I really want to know more. So I started asking people, uh, you know, what are, what do you know about this? What do you know about this? And um, these literally these things are all connected one by one because once I did the first one. Uh, the Dibble man, man, manuscript, then um, S Steve Olson at the church history department said, you ought to write about this, this panorama that we found. And I said, I am not an art historian. Um, so well, why would you ask me? And he said, well, nobody else is writing about it. Why didn't you do it? So I said, okay, so um, I am a writer. I'm very curious. And so um so that's how I stumbled into that one. And, and, and then this other, and then I had heard about Charles and of course, CCA Christians is famous. So that's, that's pretty well known. But then I, but then I heard about this Hancock panorama and I said, this is really interesting. I really want to know more about this. And um, so I was talking with the guy at the archives and I said, where, where I looked for this and I can't find it. And he said, well, you might try. And he told me, a, he told me a, a catalog number. And it was categorized under early Mormon art, a very precise descriptor. <laughs> so, so I, but once I found that, I thought that's really interesting. And so then I, I just found myself fascinated by, by this art and thinking, wow, we ought to acknowledge this and, and, and say, okay, these are came from lantern slides. So yeah, that's kind of the next step is what to do with these art pieces or publish about it or. You can see these slides have got uh, all sorts of writing on them. Um, you know, little notes about historical details, what was going on. Yeah, kind of interesting. Anyway, yeah, so it, as you said, that's there, there. You just get into these mysteries, and you, uh, for me, I just really want to know more. And so, thank, and I appreciated uh, the comment about how much time this took to put together because, um, yeah, I. I'm a little obsessed. <laughs> I probably spent uh, 12 hours this this past weekend just going, what's the story about the Hancock or the Morley settlement? And, and what is the story about this? And, you know, and so I thought, these are my friends from Missouri and Iowa. I probably better look, know this stuff a little bit before I present them. And so you, you, you have asked some really good questions. And I, I don't know about that, but but for the most part, I mean, we're kind of on the same page with, you know, we know basically Valinavu. I knew very little about that, almost nothing before he started this project. Let me take you back to Philo Dibble, if I may. Uh, yeah. uh, I don't know that enough about him, but I do recall that he was on the Council of 50. Yeah. What, uh, what, what would have given him the criteria to, to be on that elevated council? Yeah, that's a, an excellent question. So. Philo joined uh, the church near Kirtland. He was one of the early converts and and was felt uh, you know called to Missouri. He 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 was kind of he uh, I should say this. He joined the church when Oliver Cowdery and company did that were on their way through uh, on their mission to the Lamanites um, on the western the borders of the Missouri. So and, uh, and so so basically he that's he had several experiences that were really interesting um he was also he hung out with newell k whitney uh, i believe newell whitney gave him the blessed priest he was wounded in the battle of the big blue um and almost died the doctor said he's going to die and and newell whitney gave him a priesthood blessing 
and he vomited blood and the musket ball um, uh, out. And he said, I healed after that. I didn't, I didn't lose any more blood after that. I was just weak. But uh, so he, he had, he felt like it was a miraculous experience in, in um, Ohio. He uh, was at the Johnson home and recorded uh, seeing Joseph and Sydney, uh, their faces uh, bright as if with um, uh, inspiration. And so uh, while well, receiving the vision. And so, so um, that was another thing that detail that he recorded. Uh, he was um, uh, Lieutenant Colonel in the uh, Danites um, in Missouri. Um, so with all the complicated history that comes with being a Danite, um, he was one of the leaders and uh, that um, I've just read this book by uh, called Method Infinite about the connections between Freemasonry and the Danites, uh, oath bound, protect your brother um, kind of experience. And so um, so he, uh, the, the Council of 50 was the same sort of thing. It was, you've got to bring back that which was lost. We've got to um, we've got to protect, protect each other and, and swear ourselves to secrecy. Um, uh, that also, that sort of impetus is also in the, the temple ceremony, the endowment ceremony, uh, in terms of here, here's some important things that you need to know. Now you're, you're part of the initiated. I don't want you sharing this with other people. So, so I think these were all the same, the, um, the, the, the uh, anointed quorum. Yeah, this is, these are all very, very closely related movements. Uh, and I'm talking very candidly. I hope this is fine. I trust this group. But basically, they, they were ways of try, sort of um, protecting the kingdom of God in a way that they felt was really important to them. And they were willing to lose their lives uh, for this cause. Yeah. Yeah, so he's, Bile is an interesting guy. Settled in Springville. Uh, really, really wanted to, uh, an art gallery, really, um, really loved Joseph and Hiram. Cheryl Bruno was on our program a month ago and so we had her uh, presentation about the time her book came out. Yeah, fascinating. Really yeah. fascinating. I just finished reading the book, uh, wrote a little review of it and found myself going, um, yeah, th I, if there was another itch that I wanted to satisfy, that was one of the itches that I, I was just like, wait a minute, I need to learn more. I need to understand the origins of, of temple worship and how it connects with Freemasonry. I need to, I need to send it, sort of get that right in my mind. And that's actually my calling that I serve in. I'm a temple and family history leader in my ward. And so, so if there's anybody who should understand temple and family history, it's me, right? And so for me, Cheryl's book and Nick's book um, was really, really helpful because I, I found myself going, oh, okay, I see where this comes, this, this symbol goes to this, goes to that and that. And so, so it, it was really helpful to connect some dots. This likewise, uh, this uh, connection with CCA Christensen um, that had been very, very briefly mentioned uh, how that, that, that may have been an artistic influence. But then when I when I actually listed the things and saw, wait a minute, this one connects exactly with this one. This one connects with that one. This was a little bit of a stretch. OK, that one's not there. But uh, of his 23 paintings, he had um, 12 of them were looked like a pretty direct borrowing um, from from uh, Philo, and of course Philo, um, he, he wrote in the Desert News and he wrote this sort of complaint. He said, I want everybody to know <laughs> the first presidency, oh, I, I, sorry, I want everybody to know that I have the express support of the first presidency in my panorama and that um, others are trying to infringe on my you know, business. And I, I just thought it was a, a kind of a, a poignant, sad, you know, expression that he recognizes his show is in the decline and that CCA Christians and actually had a better art uh, exhibit than, than he did. And, and, and he, he couldn't shut that down and nor should he. It was, you know, a case of artistic jealousy, I guess, um, you know, and, and, and Christensen, you know, did a, did, a, did a good job. So, yeah. I find it interesting that uh, Philo Dibble apparently left a profound impact upon the following generations. Yeah. Paul Wilson, a 
I think he had two, two, two generations of his descendants who had been in, in the American Foreign Service, um, providing, yeah. providing service for people in Africa, Europe, and so forth. Um, so we yeah, got interesting family. I, that's true. And uh, David Dibble is a Latter-day Saint artist who has uh, who does some really interesting things. He's a descendant as well. And uh, Cyrus Dallin, um, who did the Angel Moroni, um, you know, famous sculpture that's on the on Latter-day Saint temples everywhere, was a stepson of uh, of Philo Dibble, and he saw these death masks, and he said, "I'm really interested in doing sculpture." So he he got into sculpture. As a result of seeing these death masks, and um, of course, became a you know a world class sculptor. I mean, he's I, don't, I can't even, he's done famous uh, American sculptures as well, and not just Latter Day Saint sculptures. But uh, yeah, so there's there's a really interesting artistic influence that you don't see directly. You just go, oh, this, this person's connected to that, and so it's, it's it's fascinating to see these connections. Devin, we are. I don't see any other hands up. Uh, we're after 10 o'clock, and so I'm going to sing the uh, good night song. And if people want to stick around and chat some more, they can. But, um, <clears throat> good night, the Lord is watching over you. Good night, his blessings go before you. Good night, and we'll be praying for you. So, good night, may God bless you. Good night.